Hello, welcome to WLOY, Loyola Radio, streaming online at WLOY.org and Campus TV Channel 111.1. You're listening to After the Whistle, Loyola's premier sports talk radio show, airing every Monday from 3 to 4 p.m. and every Friday from 1 to 2 p.m. Welcome into another Monday edition of the show, our last show here in the month of January. And we're excited. We have a lot of stuff to get into today. But first, we'll introduce ourselves like always. I'm your host today. Jeffrey Bozzi, alongside my wonderful co-host, Jimmy Cody. Jimmy, how is your Monday going so far? Uh, my Monday is going well, going well. We had some good football action this weekend, of course, as well as some good college basketball action. There was a nice Greyhound win this weekend we had here on campus. So Big was, win over Bucknell. Yeah, that was nice to see. Um, but yeah, I'm doing well, Jeff. How about yourself? I'm pretty good. Um, we'll get into the games, obviously. But yeah, no, I'm feeling good. A lot is happening right now. And it's fun to see all the sports kind of coming together with the NFL and the NBA and college basketball. There's just a lot happening, but should we get into the conference championships, shall we? Absolutely. All right. So we'll start with the NFC championship. We had the San Francisco 49ers taking on the Philadelphia Eagles yesterday. And before I get into this, Jimmy, now that we've watched this game, this is one of the weirdest games I've ever seen. Yeah. Ever. I mean, you could not have predicted. I don't think anything that happened and we'll get into that stuff, but. I don't know, just a lot of things that you would never think about happen. Yeah, well, let's start talking about it now. So the first thing that happened that I thought was absolutely bizarre is, well, the Devontae Smith catch. I mean, yeah. as soon as Kyle Shanahan, I just want to say this. As soon as you see a guy say, let's speed up to the line, and he's the guy that caught the ball, or he's the guy that was maybe down yesterday. There were two instances where this happened yesterday. Mahomes, it happened to him one time. And it was the one where they ended up changing it because his knee was on the ground before he threw the pass. And the other one was Devontae Smith. The Eagles ran up to the line. The 49ers were asleep. Uh, the cameramen at Fox were asleep. They did never showed an angle of the play. And, of course, it stands. And I don't know. I just really want to take a shot quickly at the officiating this weekend. I thought it was a nightmare. It was awful. And they in definitely were games, not on their game. In both games, it was a train wreck. It was not good at all. But yeah, we'll go back to the Devontae Smith catch that you brought up. So the Eagles had a fourth and three on their first drive of the game, and they converted because Devontae Smith had that incredible one-handed catch. And we all thought, I guess it was a catch in real time. And then you see Devontae Smith. So I'll get into that. You see him kind of do a little hand motion, say, let's hurry up, let's hurry up, because clearly maybe he didn't know if it was a catch or not. And he clearly did at the time. The 49ers don't challenge. And then the replay is shown and you can clearly see that when he's coming to the ground and try to complete the process of the catch, there's a little bobble in there. And I think the ground aided him catching the ball. So, I mean, upon further review, I think it would have clearly shown that that wouldn't have been the catch. I mean, that was significant too. I mean, that's the oh, first yeah. drive of the game it was fourth down, mind you. So assuming that play is incomplete, Niners get the ball and who knows what happens from there, but yeah, the Eagles scored on that possession seven, nothing. And then, from there, their offense just kind of disappeared for the majority of the game in the middle. They didn't do anything after that for a little while. And then they were able to take advantage of the Niners just not having a QB. And the Josh Johnson turnover. Right. That was yeah, that, unfortunate. That was a killer. But, he, was, right. he was awful. He was. Uh, there's no other way to say it. Like, I know it's such a bad situation. He's QB4. We got Garoppolo standing on the sidelines smiling. I don't know why he couldn't play. I mean, he should have been <laughs> out there. I was probably happy he didn't have to play because nobody can remember how mediocre he always is in the playoffs. Probably pumped. Oh, we're going to season's over. They don't ever have to see me. That's probably what he's thinking. But anyway, that's besides the point because the 49ers obviously are just decimated at quarterback in the middle of this game and in the point that we're talking about in the second quarter because that Purdy injury, that play for the 49ers was literally the worst play of the game because it ended up being a fumble. Right. And upon the, the review, Eagles too. The, ball, the Eagles had a challenge for that. Touch, yeah. Scored a touchdown off that. Right. Yeah. So that ended up being. You forget it was also seven seven in the second quarter because McCaffrey actually answered back with a touchdown. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they, they did not get a touchdown then off that possession. My bad. But the point is that play was awful because once Purdy got hurt, I mean the game completely changed. Yeah, and the thing that I was wondering during the game because once Purdy went out, Josh Johnson was in, and we saw Purdy on the sidelines throwing a little bit, and I wasn't sure how hurt he actually was. But apparently the report was that he couldn't really feel the nerve in his hand or his elbow. I think it was his elbow, actually. So I wasn't sure if he was actually healthy enough to go back out there. Maybe he thought, oh, I can maybe throw. Or the Niners just said, 
no, we're not going to put you out there. I think he could throw it. But he really field. couldn't throw because you saw the way that they designed their plays. They called every run play. They just ran the ball so yeah. much. He there was, and that that's kind of the story of the game. I feel like Brock Purdy gets hurt, and all the forty and or once Josh Johnson comes in, he's terrible, and to then getting hurt and I know we didn't even bring up Johnson getting hurt too. I mean, that was you nice. can't even make they it literally up. Literally, we're playing with. Like essentially no quarterback. And McCaffrey, Christian McCaffrey, that is their running back for the Niners. He ended up throwing a pass. Yeah. One, I would have tried a little harder. I mean, your back's against the wall. I, I would have I would have literally said, Hey, Christian, like I guess I, they must not feel that he has the confidence um necessary. I guess Purdy running the ball felt it is something they felt gave him a better chance. But I don't know if I really want to believe that because he like physically could not throw. Right. He could not throw the ball like past 10 yards or whatever it was. Like it was a complete non factor from the second quarter on. Like right. the 49ers literally were just running the ball. And that's so much easier for the Eagles defense. Right. It's so predictable. You know that they're going to run it every time and you know how you're going to just load up the box. And they have no chance of scoring whatsoever with, with Purdy in the game. I mean, how many pass attempts do they have in the teens? Five. I think he had five. Oh, he had five. Yeah. As a team, I mean, they, I don't think, tried to throw the ball more than, I don't know, 15, 16 yeah, times. I mean, and they threw a lot when they had Josh Johnson in the game. It looked like something they were really trying to attack. It's just that Josh Johnson couldn't make any of the reads. Um, they were, I already, which yeah. I already knew because obviously, if you're getting cut from the Broncos and their quarterback disaster, you're probably <laughs> not that good to be in with. So that was one thing I already knew. But I could tell every single time that they were in the huddle, and I don't know if you picked up on this. I see Debo and all these other guys like shaking their head. They don't know what's going on. There's confusion out there. I mean, he was just put in a situation. He was just simply not ready and not capable. Yeah, there was one play where Kittle was tough. wide open and he was just waving his hands and yeah, didn't get the ball. He was bad. It was um, really bad. And it's it's just because, unfortunate. It stinks because the 49ers literally had no quarterback. And we've seen that before. Obviously, it was a nightmare. We've seen teams play with no quarterback. It's not great. It's not great. <laughs> we've seen teams play with you know, a week old quarterback and it's not great. So it's, it's tough. Yeah. It's just not the way that the Niners would want to go out. Oh, I mean, absolutely. it's just, I think bad luck. It's just an unfortunate situation because Purdy gets hurt. And then I don't know, Johnson comes in and you think maybe that, I don't know, they could kind of stick to their game plan, maybe just kind of dump it off to the playmakers, but I don't know. They were just so limited. They just couldn't throw the ball. I mean, yeah, if you just want to simplify it, that's really what it came down to. They just didn't throw the ball after Purdy was injured. They couldn't. There was literally nothing else they could do. Right. I mean, I thought if there's one thing you want to say maybe they can do, I guess you try more McCaffrey passes. But I guess they just felt like, I mean, it, it might have not even been worth it. Yeah. It just not been good enough, and they didn't want to make themselves just look even worse. I, I have no idea. There's so many things to it, but it's just an absolutely brutal situation uh for the 49ers and it was not something that they ever had a chance to overcome right they were just kind of stuck with but if what they had talk about where they could have improved in the game i mean their defense just made it so many dumb penalties well so i was going to bring that up i thought the turning point in the game was when the eagles had the ball at the end of the second quarter and i think the niners had three penalties on the drive and it basically gave the eagles free first downs and then yeah. Boston Scott ended up running it in yes. to make it 21-7. I thought that was kind of the turning point. We're like, okay, now they're up two touchdowns. I mean, with what's going on the other side, with basically not having a QB, I mean, the Hills is probably too steep to climb. Yeah, I agree. That would that combined with the quarterback situation was absolutely the turning point. But you know what's funny, too? We talk about the Niners and how both of their QBs were hurt, and they basically were just out of QBs. The Eagles QB, Jalen Hurts, he did not have the best day either. I mean, I didn't think he was... Yeah, he missed on some deep balls. He wasn't really great. With in top accuracy. form. Um, like, can I be honest with you? Like, the Eagles kind of have not been challenged so far. I don't know how good they are. So, it's funny. Like, I was watching first take, and they asked the same question. And the question was, have the Eagles been challenged enough? And they were specifically talking about the playoffs. And so, you look at the Giants and the Niners, I mean... The Niners' defense is a challenge. I think that's the one challenge that they face. But on the other side, you look at the Eagles' D. They had to face Brock Purdy for what half a quarter? Was it even one half? Drive. Was it was it half a quarter? It was, one was it one drive? One drive. 
Oh, maybe I thought it was two drives for some reason. So one well, drive. One total drive. But then didn't that happen on second down? I think so. You yeah. probably remember better than so, I do. Yeah. And then they faced Daniel Jones the week before. <laughs> um, and we saw that one, but. They look kind of like Purdy, honestly. Yeah, I guess, I don't know. If you're being technical about them being challenged, I think the last, I don't know. Cowboys. Potent offense was the Cowboys game Cowboys. on Christmas Eve when they gave up 40. Yeah, and this is a new monster. This is better than the Cowboys. Yeah, and Stephen A. Smith was bringing this up, and he was saying that the Eagles, yeah, they've been tested a little bit. I mean, they've also played 19 total games, so I guess there's a test in each one of those games. But this is Patrick Mahomes. I mean, we'll get into more of this probably at the end of the week and definitely more next week. But, yeah, this is no joke. I mean, this is the cream of the crop when you talk about quarterbacks. Uh, Yeah, he might be the best ever. Player. I mean, I didn't even mention no, no, Travis Kelsey. Good. Travis Kelsey is another massive nightmare for every defense, but – We'll get into that more later, but and also it's two weeks for his ankle to heal up. True. Well, and the other thing too is they did have other players who were injured yesterday, so we'll have to see about their status as well. So yeah, but it was almost like when they lost Sneed. Well, I'm just saying this now for the sake of it. When they did lose Sneed yesterday, I thought that was going to kill their defense. Surprisingly, it's it really didn't. Yeah, it did not. But we'll we'll continue talking about them after we finish with the Eagles here and their 49ers and Jeff. Obviously, we're kind of at the point now of, of halftime here. It's 21-7. The 49ers know they have essentially no way of throwing the ball because Brock Purdy couldn't throw, and they literally just were sticking him out there. And in the second half, I mean, the Eagles' offense, I felt like they had the chance to not, not like, pour it on, but, like, if they really were going to, like, flex their muscles in a way that I think people expect from, like, a high-powered offense. Now, I'll be granted, great defense on the other side, but I don't think they played their best game yesterday. Yeah. I was. I mean, I just was expecting a little bit more from the offense. Right. It's almost like they turned it down a little bit of a notch in the third quarter because they ended up winning 31-7. I mean, you look at that score and you're thinking, all right, that's a blowout, but I don't know. They ran the ball well by committee, and the thing was – Oh, yeah, they ran coming the ball in super strong. Absolutely. The thing coming into that I said was they got to take advantage of the outside, throw it to Brown and Smith. They didn't really do that. No. I just felt like Brown should have had more targets. You know what they did a really good job of? And Greg Olson was talking about this yesterday during the game. It was running to the weak side. They were just, their linemen were just getting out there fast enough. And the running backs just had such great vision, particularly Sanders and Gainwell, um, that when they ran to the weak side, it was just open because the 49ers for the like their linebackers just couldn't get to the other side of the field fast enough because they were also worried about the pass because there's a option to run or pass. And it's just, I don't know. I just thought that the Eagles honestly had a good scheme. Like, yeah, they did a pretty good job with especially with running the ball. And that's I think gonna be gotta be their strength in the Super Bowl, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the bread and butter that you gotta go to. Yeah. It's worked for them the last two years. I mean, I wouldn't go against that. And the other thing too that I noticed and this might have to do with the scheme that you talk about. I feel like a lot of the formation was Hurts in the shotgun with Sanders or Gainwell right next to him. I feel like there wasn't a lot of just straight up shotgun or not a lot of play action where Hurts is right by Kelsey and he runs back. I don't. I just felt like the setup was kind of similar. I don't know. It felt very repetitive. Yeah, but I guess at that point. But I guess when you have the lead, it's different. And also, you don't want to show too much, right? Because you're going to be playing the biggest game the week after. I guess that's possibly it. But that that's like a possibility. But at the same time, too, I mean, I don't think it's anything to be super concerned about. Um, I, I mean, listen, they won the game. They did what they did. They took care of the business that they had to do. And I don't know. I, I mean, what do you think? Re like, realistically, what are you looking at going forward? Like, how do you think you match up against the Chiefs? I guess – the first thing I think about with the Chiefs is Mahomes and the Eagles have not faced a QB like Mahomes all year. So you know that he does most of his damage. I mean, a lot of his damage with his arm. So I feel like the secondary especially is going to be tested. And I don't know if they're going to have one guy on Travis Kelsey or multiple guys kind of do a by committee thing, but he's got to be the guy you take away over the middle of the field. And I know that the linebackers can get to the QB. I think that they can get to Mahomes. I know the Chiefs line is really good, but I like the D line that the Eagles have. It's just, over the middle, like, are you going to be able to stop Kelsey? I just don't know. And the, I didn't yeah, even bring up who's covering Kelsey. That's really what I mean. Is. That's number one. Um, if there's a lot of guys, there's a lot of other things. Great. I mean, 
you talk about Pacheco in the backfield. I mean, that's another guy you have to worry about. Jose Pacheco. Yeah, and then you have Juju Smith-Schuster and Nico Hardman and uh, Mark Marquez Valdez Scantling. I mean, yeah, those are guys who really, really stepped up yesterday. Can make plays. He was great yesterday. Yeah. Um, I trust that Slay and Bradbury can guard Valdez Scantling and Juju Smith-Schuster one on one. I mean, I would take my chances there, but I think Kelsey is the main concern, but. Defensively, I think the O line is another key because while the Chiefs defense, we talked about this on the show even last week, it's not a good defense. But if there's one thing that they can do, they can get to the quarterback. I mean, they've had the second most sacks all year, and partly it's because they have Chris Jones and Frank Clark. So I think those are the two guys where if you're the O line, you got to focus on them. I mean, I don't know if you double to start or maybe well, you put. Hold on. I mean, I thought you guys did a fantastic job of slowing down Nick Bosa yesterday. So right, and he was kind of gingerly walking a few times and yeah. i don't know if he got hurt middle of the game he, he clearly did, did. yeah he definitely wasn't 100 yeah but that would know. give you confidence though if you could do it to nick bosa you could probably do it to chris jones yeah exactly um yeah but i don't know it's just weird coming from my side of things just because i was an eagles fan watching the game yesterday because it's just unfortunate to see that the niners had both of their qbs already injured and then they had two more go down in the same game yesterday within matter of minutes i don't know it's just not the way that i thought it would go i thought it'd be pretty close to the end i think maybe a field goal could have decided i mean assuming purdy was healthy but yeah it's just not the way that the niners i think wanted to end their season it did, everything just came crashing down i think everything that could have gone wrong went wrong just starting with the qb injuries yeah it's just weird because that's a good way. Of, no, there, there's good nothing way of the that. there's nothing the Eagles could have done. I mean, no. you just kind of play the game, and they did. And credit to them to win. It's just I don't know. I think people could maybe put an asterisk and say, "Oh, well, they won playing Josh Johnson for seventy five percent of the game." Like I don't know. Yeah, I mean that's something that can be said. But at the end of the day, I think the next game is what matters more. Yeah. Um, if the Eagles go out and win the Super Bowl, then. It is what it is. But if they lose, I mean, that's something that can be said by the 49ers, obviously. But yeah, we'll have to see when we eventually reach that point. I think it's time to move into the second game. What do you think? Yeah, let's do it. So this is definitely more interesting of a game than the first game. And we're talking about the Cincinnati Bengals and the Kansas City Chiefs, which was a rematch of last year's AFC Championship game. And coming in, we both picked the Bengals and, you know, I thought early on, Jimmy, they looked terrible on offense. They, Joe Mixon was not getting the ball. And that's the what, main like, reason. What the heck? No carries at all. And GP Ryan got like, their first drive. Meanwhile, Joe Mixon was amazing. Well, and you know what's the Bills? What are we doing out there, Zach Taylor? Come on. I know. And you know what's funny, too? I was looking at the box score, and I don't know when I read this, but Mixon at the time had six carries, I think. I'm not sure if it was him having six carries or the team had six carries. And then I looked at Kansas City, and they only ran the ball, I think, eight times. This must have been, I think, midway through the second quarter, maybe later part of the first half. But they were just ditching the run completely. And it's not like they were down. I mean, they were only down, I think, 6 nothing for a good part of that first half. And then I think they got a field goal. And then Travis Kelsey had that big touchdown. But I just don't understand it. They looked like the Bengals from September and October of the season where – it's almost like Burrow just is going to throw it 50 something times and Mixon. It's almost like he doesn't even exist out there because yeah, he's just I, not getting the ball. Yeah, I don't know what the I don't game, know what the game plan was. I don't know what the game plan was there either. It was terrible. And honestly, like, I'm going to be honest, like, I thought the Bengals offense let them down. I mean, yeah. I didn't think the defense played that bad. They helped Kansas City with a lot of field goals. That's what you got to do against this that team. Right? Yeah. yeah. Only gave up two touchdowns. I mean, yeah, you give up 23 to the Chiefs. I think that's a win on most days for any defense. Especially when you have Joe Burrow on offense. I mean, I, granted, he had a couple interceptions. Right. And he just was not in his type of form. I mean, he had some good moments, but, I mean, the Chiefs just seemed to take Jamar Chase kind of out of the game a little bit. Not out of the game because he still had six yards for 75, but he never was able to have that, like, big, massive play. Yeah, I think the only time he had the big play was that fourth down. Yeah, conversion. But at that was the really. Well, he also had a thirty-five yard catch. Right. Yeah. So I mean, he he had a couple big plays, but no you know, touchdowns. Yeah, no touchdowns. That was what really hurt them. One, Jamar Chase not being effective with touchdowns. Number two, not getting mixed in the ball. Number three, their offensive line just committed so many penalties. 
they, and they also just gave up a lot of sacks. They were just getting absolutely dominated out there. And I mean, for the offense, the last thing that I thought was a huge deal that nobody really talked about was once Tyler Boyd came out. Right. I mean, that is such a step off from Tyler Boyd to, you know, their wide receiver four. Yeah. Like, what's his name? Irwin. Right? Yeah, Irwin. something Irwin. Yeah, Trenton Irwin. Forgive us for not forgetting. I think he thinks Trenton Irwin. Name. Yeah. Yeah, that puts more pressure on Hayden Hurst and T. Higgins. Yeah. And Jamar Chase. Cool. And Higgins had a nice game. Um, but it's just, you know what it was too for the Bengals? Every time I felt like they were really going to, you know, break it open on offense, like specifically that final two minute drive, I thought Zach Taylor mismanaged the timeouts. You know, I thought he called the last one a little bit early. Then they only ended up taking that, you know, couple quick plays at the end zone. Neither of them were good looks, I thought. And then they had to kick, and they only ended up with six points. Right. There was one play where they get down to the, I don't even know, five-yard line, and then they trim off 15, 20 seconds because they took forever to get to the line. Yeah. And then I think Burrow threw a fade out to the left. I don't know who it was to, but incomplete. And then they didn't do anything there. But Yeah. No, yeah. it was nothing – it was not great down there in the red zone. You got to make the most of your opportunities, especially when your defense is holding the other one to field goals. And listen, we can sit here too. And I know that's, that's the story of the first half, right? Like the Bengals offense was sleepwalking out there and the defense was kind of keeping them in the game, but then the, their offense finally wakes up, but it doesn't wake up enough. You know what I mean? It still did, but never played good enough, I felt like, for the team to win. I think part of it, too, was we talked about how good the O-line was last week. And do you think the injuries probably caught up a little bit to them this week? I think it caught up. Because Kansas City had five they, sacks. they went up against a good D-line. Yeah. Like an underrated D-line. Like, they're, listen, Chris Jones is obviously a really good player. But then they also have some other sneaky good players. Carl Laftis, who's a rookie, right? He was first-round pick. That wasn't a bad at all he had a nice sack i think in the playoff game yesterday so you know they, they might have improved in some of these other areas in the past but yeah frank know, clark too frank clark as well yeah how can we can forget about frank clark and then also too he got hurt but um willie gay yeah no he's a solid player yeah he's a solid player throughout the year he's been good for them he's a good pass rusher. i will say we were talking about mahomes too just coming into the week with the ankle injury i thought he looked okay i thought he was pretty mobile I yeah, thought I, I didn't think it was actually, he didn't look 100%. I think he was kind of moving around a little tentatively, but I don't know. He seemed pretty comfortable back there. I just thought their execution was really good. I thought early on their offense had a really good tempo. I thought they were in rhythm. I yeah, thought no. he was kind of just slinging it out wide to Kelsey or Vada Scantling, and then they would mix it in the run with Pacheco. I just thought they did a good job of kind of mixing it up. That's kind of why they've been great all year, too, because we talk about, oh, they lost Tyree Kill. I mean, who's going to be the number one? But kind of made Kelsey the number one and they kind of distribute the ball to everyone else. Yeah, they had a completely different look on offense than what we're kind of accustomed to. They went for a lot of those shorter plays, like you were saying, like the quick passing. Um, and I think that's because they knew that Patrick Mahomes' leg wasn't as great, as in great shape as it obviously could be. Right. Um, but um, I thought that was good for them because it kind of opened up the deep passes when they wanted to run them. Like it was a little bit there. I mean, it was it was open, obviously. Marquez Valdez Scantling, I thought was the guy who took the most advantage of it. And he had a phenomenal game. Same with Kelsey, too. He got his with the touchdown. Right. Um, I mean, listen, for what it was, for what the circumstances was, and how concerned everybody was about Mahomes, he was not in any way like an issue for the Chiefs. And you brought this up a few minutes ago when we were talking about the other game. You give his ankle two weeks to heal. I mean, yeah. he could be more of a threat on the ground, too, if he has to escape out of pressure. And not and only that, that if, you, for, if yeah. you roll him out to the right side, left side, you get those deep shots. I mean, kind of just opens up the playbook even more. It gives Andy Reid more options. Yeah, and, you know, he still didn't have that many weapons yesterday. Tony got hurt. Nicole Hardman got hurt. Right. In the game. I mean, those are two guys that He's they've relied on. more out there with Marquez Valdez scaling and Kelsey. And, I mean... <laughs> Literally, that's and and Juju. That was literally what they had out there. Right. They were at some points they were going to three tight ends. Right. So we've talked a lot about the X's and O's. I feel like this is worth bringing up. So we've had some controversial stuff with the officiating. I mean, you brought it up earlier with the Niners Eagles, but I feel like this game had more of it. Yeah. Oh. I, I just feel like there were more obvious moments where you're watching the game and you see the refs call one thing and you're like, huh? So I mean, where do you even start? I mean, there's the one play where. 
the Chiefs had the do over. I don't know what that down was it was. That I was think it was it a third, third down. down. Third down. It was a third down. And I'm trying to remember. I think it was in the fourth quarter. It was. And the reason I think why they got a do over is because the refs just ruled the play dead. There was something up with the clock, maybe. Yeah, that's what they said. There was not sure if it was the play clock or the game clock, but I think it was the play clock. The Chiefs did not get the original first down conversion on that play. They got ended up getting a do over and. Did they get it on the they second? Did not they did it. not get it. Ended it. up working, but just like working in favor of the way it should, because the Bengals really got two stops, and that was really unfair. And that's a play too that was with the game on the line. Yeah, if the Chiefs get it, I yeah, mean, that was yeah. horrible. Just this game said that. Yeah. So that's the first one. Um, the second one. Listen, we're gonna talk about. The, I think the last play of the game. Right, I think that's the big controversy. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just you know they're gonna call that he's the best quarterback in the league. Right. Like, There's course, no need to hit him when he's going out of bounds. Oh, that, I still don't know if he would have made the field goal without the penalty. No, so that's what Tony Romo was saying. If the penalty didn't happen, it would have been a fifty. It would have been a fifty-five yard attempt for Bucker. Instead, it was forty. And fifty-five in that cold. I mean, it felt tough. in the single digits. I think it felt like nine degrees or six degrees the whole game. I think it went down to six degrees from nine. But yeah, I don't know if Bucker would have had the leg to get it there. Yeah, I don't know. And you know what? Even when they showed the replay of him making the forty yarder, I mean, he made it fair and square. I mean, he drilled it dead center, but it's not like he made it by a mile. I mean, no, no. That was probably I don't know. I don't know. I thought like ten to fifteen ten, feet. I thought it was yeah between was, the ball and the crossbar. Yeah, so I don't know. I mean, I you add fifteen just, yards. It's huge. Yeah, you exactly. don't know if some gust of winds are going to come That's in at that, that time. Was so silly, and it all started too with the big return. Right, that was a yeah, huge play. That return was, I mean, that was that's a, a forgotten return. play. Yeah, no, 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 that was the biggest play. That was a really nice return. I mean, they got the ball near midfield. Yeah, I mean, that's huge. I mean, and they had timeout. Yeah, come on, for Mahomes. Yeah, I mean, we've seen this movie before. Yeah, exactly. Um, Meanwhile, all they got to do is get him out of bounds or get him down in bounds. Yeah, you got to make him just chew the clock and then I don't know. Oh, I know, such a the Bengals really just their defense, I thought, really played okay, but just on that last drive, I mean, just too many just mistakes. I also saw too, for what it's worth, it was a really bad hold on that play that was missed on Trey Hendrickson. Oh, that was Boy, bad. Daniel Brown, that was so bad. So my roommates were screaming. Yeah, that was pretty bad. Um, not 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 great look there for the officials, especially because it just felt like it went a lot in the Chiefs' favor. Yeah, I don't think just these seems to for crews like, will Mahomes get the Super guy. Bowl. He always seems to find a way. <laughs> yeah, and for Mahomes, it was his first ever victory against Joe Burrow. He now is one in three. Yeah, and gets a little bit of a monkey off his back. A little bit, but uh, I mean, they were celebrating an awful lot. Um, they really were. Yeah. Oof. I mean, the Cincinnati mayor calling, I mean, what are you doing? Just, uh, that guy's an idiot. He's just he's like, asking he, for he, a death yeah, sentence. He just opened up a whole can of worms. That's all what he did. And then calling it Burrowhead. Oh, oh yeah. Jeez, again. There were signs what are you all doing? over Burrowhead yesterday. Yeah, I mean, Arrowhead. The last thing we need <laughs> is to give motivation to the best quarterback in the NFL, right? Like, we do not need that. There needs to be no further um motivation for him he's already good enough right good. yeah and then he'll have his well he had another shot at super bowl but he lost it to tampa bay so he'll have his third appearance in the super bowl so he's going for number two yeah he's going for number two i remember we sat on the show i think i said he would end up with four when it's all said and done i think you said one i did say one jeff i did say one yeah and he was I mean, it's still true. Yeah. It has, could still be true. I mean, we don't know. Um, it's not looking too great, though. I can tell you that right now. I mean, yeah, a lot of things I think have to go right. I mean, he needs to get healthy, which I think he will. His other teammates will have to get healthy. But, I mean, any given Sunday, it's really hard to bet against the man. That's all I'm going to say. It's very hard to bet against the man. He does things, not just at the QB position, but he does things as a football player that not a lot of people can do. Yeah, he just... The number one thing I would say about his game that he does better than anybody else is the off script stuff. I mean, he's just outstanding at it. And that's what makes it so tough. You can't tackle him. He does the no look passes. He can throw it as far as anybody. He's as accurate as anybody. Um, he's as elusive as everybody in the pocket, right? You can't bring him down at all. It helps they have a good old line. 
And he also has a great coach, too. Right. And Andy Reid is a great play caller. I mean, we don't, I mean, I don't know if they would be having this success if it wasn't this combo. Because obviously we saw Andy Reid do a good job with Alex Smith, but really the Chiefs franchise took it to another level when Patrick Mahomes did. Right. It's one thing to be a perennial playoff team. And that's what the Chiefs were with Alex Smith. But once they trapped him at home to the game of shot, I mean, they saw that this guy's and in the real deal. That's what the 49ers were trying to do. Right. Right, and they just like, got kind of screwed. Trey Lance, like, all right, we want this guy to be our Mahomes. Obviously. Right, and maybe do they do they try it again next year? They get a do over? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Especially the way that Purdy finished the year and then got them to the NFC Championship. There's just a lot of question marks there. Yeah, I mean, Purdy and Lance are both under contract next year, so they'll both be back. Because and then both you, on rookie deal. You got Jimmy G in there too. I don't know. Jimmy, Jimmy G. has gone. Who's I think he is. He's gone. He's got to be gone. There's no way that they're going to pay him whatever amount I feel like that he's going to want. I thought he'd be gone after last season, but after bringing him back and seeing that they still spent a lot of draft capital to get Lance, and then the fact that Purdy came out of nowhere and now he is in the mix, I just don't think there's space. There's no space, and also it just doesn't make financial sense because they got to pay players on their defense. Right, too. Garoppolo's got a rich contract. He too. does have a very well. It's it was modified for this year because obviously he took on the quote unquote backup role, but there was a lot of incentives. And I'm sure another team would be willing to take him on. I mean, he's pretty decent. Could be the Jets. Yeah, could be the Raiders. I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of yeah. It could be the Raiders. A lot of teams you could throw. There's at a there. lot of teams. For sure. For sure. Um, yeah, there's a lot of question marks there, but yeah, we'll talk about Chiefs Eagles, I guess, coming up in the next two weeks. I keep forgetting there's a bye week in there. Yeah, we got the silly Pro Bowl flag game this week. Yeah, I'm kind of glad they nixed the game, but yeah. it'll be kind of weird without a, I guess, quote unquote, all star game. Eh, it's fine. Nobody cares anyway. I guess I'd rather watch dodgeball. Instead. Yeah, no, I would too. I mean, they got some new dunk tank game and they got some long drive golf competition. Oh. Yeah, so something to watch for. Um, this is actually a funny like AFC Pro Bowl thing that we might get to laugh about. Um, so Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrow is going to be playing in the Super Bowl and they're out of the Pro Bowl game. So Tua is an alternate. He's hurt. Her- Herbert's an alternate. He's hurt. Lamar Jackson's an alternate. He's hurt. Wow. Do you know who the fourth alternate is for the AFC? It's Tyler Hunt. Tyler, Tyler Huntley. Huntley? Are you kidding? Tyler me? Huntley. And that's from Field Yates, who works for ESPN. So it's not like just something that I just found myself. No, that's legit. Like that. Yeah, that is Tyler kind of, Huntley. Kind of funny, isn't it? Tyler Huntley wow. might technically be a Pro Bowler this year because he was Bowman. I think that's that all the other quarterbacks, though, in the AFC. Carr. Russ, I mean, like all those guys, like they were behind. I mean, I'm not saying that those guys are deserving. I just would think that they're Tyler more. They're Huntley. They're more popular. Like I would. Trevor Lawrence. Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, I would think Trevor Lawrence would be like. I guess he's just because he plays for the Jaguars. Yeah, it wouldn't be Tannehill. It's not going to be Davis Mills. It's not going to be Deshaun Watson or Kenny Pickett. I mean, I don't know. They might have been better options than. I think so. I think Pickett would have been better. Yeah, option. Pickett. Or Maybe even Mac Jones Mac would have been a better Jones, option. Kenny Pickett. I don't know. Mike White. <laughs> I I would have sent Flacco. Just send him for the heck of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's I just so weird now because they don't have a game. Yeah, but so you still make a Pro Bowl but this team. Guy, Tyler Huntley. So you're basically making an all-star team without playing the game, is essentially what this is. Yeah, now. but like see, like we don't need to have alternates if there's no game. Like Tyler Huntley doesn't need to be announced right. as a pro. I know. I, like that's silly. Because no offense to the guy. I mean, he's a good backup quarterback. I mean, he's well, done he's good. Okay, backup. Yeah, he's done like good twenty twenty. He's won a few games here and there for the Ravens in the first, last first, two first, years. One, but like a pro ball alternate. I don't know. Yeah, that's that is kind of funny that he was the fourth QB in line for that list. Yeah, I know that is kind of fascinating. That is very fascinating, in my opinion. Yeah, we actually speaking of all star weekends and whatnot we have that this week we have the nhl all-star week i think this week or maybe this weekend and then we have the nba all-star weekend in two to three weeks time so a lot of all-star festivities happening yeah no i know it's a good it's a sneaky good time on the sports calendar because obviously nfl playoffs the super bowl 
Super Bowl is the second week of February. It ends, right? Then we got a month to March Madness. Right. So it's going to be an exciting time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, I think we'll take a quick break here after the whistle. We might talk some NBA and some other basketball and other news on the other side of the break. So stay with us. We will be right back. Welcome back to WLOI, Loyola Radio, streaming online at WLOI.org and Campus TV channel 111.1. You're listening to After the Whistle. I'm Jeffrey Bozzi alongside Jimmy Cody, and we're going to now switch gears and get into some basketball, and we're going to start on the collegiate side. And Jimmy, the Loyola Greyhounds men's basketball team, they had a big win on Saturday. They took down the Bucknell Bison by a score of 80 to 66. And we were both in attendance. So I guess I'll just throw it to you to start. What were your overall thoughts? What did you think that the Greyhounds did well on Saturday? What do you think was the key thing that made them get the win? Defense. It was all about defense, baby. I thought we played a pretty good defensive game, um, especially Deion Perry. He was just phenomenal with his defensive skills. I thought really played a good game, you know. Him and I thought Jalen Andrews were really our most effective players on offense. Um, overall, I thought we had to kind of like dig deep to find this win because we kind of got out to a good lead. And I thought, all right, like we, we definitely got a chance today, but we kind of like let them right back into that game and made it very tight and very close to the second half, despite what the score says. No, for sure. I think the defense was phenomenal. I mean, holding Bucknell at 66 is definitely a win. And I was going to flip it to the offensive side. You bring up Deion Perry on defense. He was equally as good on offense. I mean, he dropped 20 points, and I thought he was hitting a lot of shots on the outside, and that's a thing that he can do. We've seen it from time to time again. He has the capability to hit shots from anywhere on the floor, and you brought up Jalen Andrews. He had a very quiet 24 points. He was just very efficient, seven for eight from the field. I mean, talk about being very efficient and getting inside. I mean, that's the recipe for success, and then – I thought early on the bigs weren't involved much offensively. And I thought as it went on, I think Tavares Hardy and company tried to get the ball more inside. And I thought that was a good adjustment that they made, especially down the stretch in the second half. They got the golden DK and Alonzo Fowry going a little bit. They had 10 and 12 points respectively. So it's good to see them getting some points there because they need points inside. I mean, the easiest place to score in the court is when you get into the paint. So I think if you give it to Golden or Alonzo and they make some quick decisions with post moves, I think that's a good recipe for success too. But I also thought yeah. Chris Kuzenka played some good defensive minutes too. You know, he he was just good effective minutes, but I thought he did especially good on defense. Yeah, he's very active, very yeah, quick. Very active and very quick. You know what? I thought we did a good job of fighting over the screens. Yeah. Yeah. I thought Bucknell, they used a lot of the shot clock, but I felt like a lot of times they still have the ball up top and there'd be five, four, three, two, one on the shot clock. And they had to chuck up a lot of long threes. Well, you know what I like too? We, what was nice about this game was we finally shot well from three, but we didn't take that many shots from three. We took only 14. We went 50%. Yeah. I think we look sometimes for shots. teams like to run and gun threes, depending on who they have. And, I don't really view the Greyhounds as a big three-point shooting team, but Mm -hmm. you're going to take your chances when you get them. But I thought they did a good job of selecting when they had to shoot. Absolutely. And I think they just got to keep running their offense because they put up 80 points. Right. I agree. If they put up 80 points every game, like we're going to be like, whoa, 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 this is nice. You know? Yeah. And I thought Deion Perry did a good job of choosing when to shoot threes. And it's funny because – so a lot of his threes in this game were kind of off schedule. I mean, he would get the ball coming up half court and he'd just pull up, but – I don't know. Sometimes when you're feeling it, I mean, that's all you need. If you just see one shot go in, I feel like the ball is just easier to put in the basket. I feel like the basket could be so much bigger. But yeah, it was definitely a much-needed win for the Greyhounds. They got their third conference win of the season. And now they get a tough one tonight, Jimmy. I don't know if you saw, they go yes. up to Colgate tonight. And Colgate. we know what Colgate is. We know what their pedigree is. They've been at the top of the Patriot League, not just – this year again but for the last few years and they're 10 and 0 in the league and i don't know i feel like they're gonna get everyone's best shots so i don't know what do you think the greyhounds have to do tonight because 
obviously the offense was there. The defense is clearly there. You kind of just have to build off of that. But I don't know. You think there's one guy in particular that they could go to? Maybe it's Deion Perry, Jay Landers, or someone else? It's going to have to be a total team effort because that's what it was on Saturday. Four of our five starters were in double figures. Everybody contributed. That has to be the same thing today. We can't have turnovers. That's the first thing. We have to make free throws. That is the second thing we must do. Third, we got to keep up the defensive energy that we had on Saturday, especially early on. I liked our defensive energy from the get-go. I thought we weren't allowing uh, Bucknell any good looks. We cannot let Colgate get good looks because, let's face it, we know a lot of these players for a while. Tucker Richardson's been on the team for a few years. Like, he can hit threes. Like, he's a good shooter. Like, he's going to make those shots if he's open. Um, we got to – really, I think it starts on the defensive end of the floor. And then on offense, I think it's about just running our offense and just waiting for the good shots to come because I thought that's what we did the other day. Yeah, I agree when you say that it has to be a total team effort because you're looking here at Colgate. They have a very balanced scoring attack. They have four guys in double figures with averages of 14, 12, 12, and 11. They have other guys who average nine, six, and six. So they score in a lot of different ways. It's not like it's just coming from one guy. Obviously, Richardson's the catalyst, but Keegan Records and Smith and Lynch Daniels, they have a lot of guys who can fill it up. So I think communicating on defense is key. You got to call out the switches and you got to be able to fight over screens, like you said. And they did a good job of that on Saturday. So it's definitely going to be a big test tonight. But I think down low, I'm really looking at the bigs and if they can stop records. Because I think records has kind of hurt the Hounds in the past. I feel like he's just so hard to guard down there because he's 6'10". He's just a big body. And you know we have the guys to stop him. Yeah. Too. Honestly, like right. this Colgate team, I will say this, they give up a lot more points than the other ones in the past. So that's why if we really focus on the defensive end of the floor and just wait for our shots to come and wait for the opportunities to be there, then, like, I think we have a very good chance in this game. Like, it's going to be tough. Right. Like, it's a 16 and a half point spread. That's a lot. That's, that's a lot of a points. Lot for but at the same time, that doesn't mean much. It actually went down. I think it was 17 and a half last oh, okay. night. Oh, yeah, maybe no, it's a summer. Nobody's giving the Greyhounds much of a chance tonight on CBS Sports Network. But, hey, <laughs> I wouldn't count them out. That's yeah, I wouldn't either. Hopefully they have a good showing for the national TV audience. But yeah, absolutely. I agree. We can throw Golden DK or Alonzo Fowre or Belko Illich at them. I think it's good that you can throw different guys at Keegan Records to give them different looks. And yeah, I think the other key is you got to rebound the ball. I thought another thing that kind of went unnoticed, and I don't think this is a problem at all. I think it was a very, very, very minor problem. There were a few times where Bucknell would take a shot from the outside and I don't know if it was just bad luck the way the ball would bounce off the rim, but I don't know. They had a good amount of offensive rebounds. I think you got to clean that up a little bit. And you don't want to give a team like Colgate more chances because they can score in bunches. So I don't know. I think there is some confidence going into this game tonight. I know it's a really tough task, especially on the road. You got to go up to Colgate. And yeah, it's definitely going to be a monumental climb, but we'll see. Yeah, we will see. I mean, hopefully they play their game, right? Just say, just to go out there and do what the best you can, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, run the Tavares Hardy offense. Yeah. Exactly. So we'll see how that goes. Best of luck to the Hounds tonight. But, Jimmy, I wanted to bring up some NBA stuff. And, I don't know, the season, it's kind of just humming along a little bit. I feel like it's just any other year. You kind of get into the end of January, February. I feel like once the All-Star break comes, I think people pay a little more attention. But, I don't know. I feel like with the NFL going on, they might steal a little bit of a spotlight, but I'm not sure if you saw in the Lakers Celtics game from Saturday night. So obviously that's two historic franchises facing off. But anyway, I'll get to the point that I'm trying to make at the end of the game, LeBron James had the ball and he had a chance for the Lakers to win. He's driving in and he clearly gets fouled by Jason Tatum, but the refs missed it. And so subsequently and they go to overtime and he lost his mind and you know what's funny? I thought he got a technical foul. I mean, that should have been an obvious tech. And I don't know if he did. Who got a technical foul was Patrick Beverly. Yeah. He took one of the cameras that I think one of the photographers, photographers had, and he went up to the referee <laughs> and showed the ref literally Tatum's hand touching LeBron. And I know it's one thing to do that, but that's obviously going to warrant a technical foul. But 
Yeah, of course. Of course that is. The refs actually ended up releasing a statement, I think, the day after on their Twitter account saying, refs make mistakes all the time. Like, people are like, yeah, it's very true, but we missed a mistake here. And they acknowledge that they made the mistake, but yeah, I don't know. Do you think if it was any other player besides LeBron, they would have that kind of response? I say 100% not. Yeah, I don't know. I think Absolutely you... Absolutely not. But I think you're right. talking about it the next day. Oh, he was. He like they had Tatum him. were going at it on yeah. Instagram a little bit. Yeah. On Instagram. He was going after him. Yeah, if it was someone that wasn't LeBron, I mean, I don't know. There might be another player, like a KD or like a Steph, but I don't know. LeBron's like the main guy. I don't think they would have had the same response to it no, if it was someone else. No, I think there's only a handful of guys. Like Luca. I mean, he complains every game. Nobody yeah, he's a big him. complainer. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just a bad missed call, and it's unfortunate because it ended up costing them the game. They lost by four to Boston, but – is it a bad call? Yes. Did LeBron go crazy? Yes. I don't know how he didn't get a technical for that. I mean, it was because of LeBron. It's unbelievable. Yeah. But now it's a tough loss for the Lakers. But I'm looking at the standings here, Jimmy. And the East, I think, honestly, has stolen more of the spotlight than the West. And it's funny. I feel like the last few years, we're talking about the West and the East and which conference is better. We're thinking, oh, it's definitely the West. I mean, you have teams from – over the years that have been good, such as the Warriors, and you've always had these pretty decent teams, such as the Grizzlies and the Nuggets and the Clippers, the Mavericks, the Suns. But I feel like the East this year is just more top-heavy because you're looking here at one through even five, Boston, Philly, Milwaukee, Brooklyn, and Cleveland. I think there's arguments to be made for each team, but I think it really comes down to – the top four because Boston, we know they've been there in the finals last year, and we know that they basically the same top team five. from last year. I really think it's the top five. Like, I don't know why you're excluded. I would say it's the top six. You think so? Miami's got that experience. No, they do too. I just haven't really seen it from them as much this year. They yeah, can they, they no, can do it though. They, no, they haven't shown it this year. They've had a slow start. Yeah, they definitely have had a slow start. But at the same time, they are only nine back. No, they they would be a definitely a scary first round opponent for any team. I don't think anyone would have played the Heat. Mm-hmm, absolutely but but they're seven three in their last 10 they they're are they better. they're kind of rounding they're are rounding a corner a little bit but i don't know you know i'll just ask you straight up you're looking at those teams in the east i guess who's your east pick right now i'm not sure if you had a preseason pick because mine was actually the bucks but i guess i'll stay with them for now but i'm kind of i'm you know what hmm, it's tough i'll stick with the bucks for now i almost was going to switch it to the celtics but I'll go with the Bucs. I trust their DNA. I think so. The, the three teams that I think are the major, major players are obviously the Celtics. Yes. The Celtics have been there, done that. I still think it's ultimately going to run through Boston this year. Um, I The Bucs as well. Like they have Giannis. You can't underestimate the star player enough. And the third team is the Nets. They're not really like getting that kind of respect, I feel like. I mean, I know it's they're a very interesting team, to say the least very up and down team but you know at the end of the day they still have a lot of talent that's for sure yeah and they're in a weird spot right now because durant has been injured and he's not going to come back for another week or two maybe three weeks so they're still playing okay yeah they're playing fine they're 30 and 19 the drama's definitely been put to bed at least for the time being i mean kyrie's been balling yeah simmons has been putting up his like six assists a game too so <laughs> have to deal with that. Yeah, and they have a lot of other shooting. I mean, they have seven Seth points. Curry and Joe Harris. Seven points is what Simmons averages. I mean, I know he's not a scorer, but geez, dude. Really? Yeah. Like, I mean, that, that's really like the one thing in his game that he has just never taken. Like, from where he was as like a rookie to now, just the scoring is the one thing that he never caught up with. He could be a fantastic player if he was a scorer. Really. He would be complete. I think a lot of it too has to do with the mental side too. I feel Absolutely. like sometimes he doesn't attack the rim and I'll bring this up too, just because I saw him play the Sixers in the last week or so he took over in the third quarter. I think he had 10 points in the third quarter when he's putting his head down and driving. I mean, you forget that he's six ten. So I mean, nine times out of 10, he's going to get to the rim whenever he wants. Yeah. But when he gets the rim, if he gets fouled, it might be a nightmare because we don't know if he can make the free throw. Right. That's a, the other thing. And then the second thing is I just wish, I don't know, as someone who I guess, has seen him play a lot just from him being on the Sixers. You see him go through these stretches where he could go for a week or two and average 17, nine and eight, and he could be phenomenal. But 
There's other games where he's just invisible on offense. He's not even willing to take shots. It, it would be frustrating if I was a Nets fan because you would expect him to step up with a guy like Kevin Durant out for a long period of time. You kind of think he could be the number two option, but he's really not. I mean, he's you know, just invisible on offense at times. No, he, I wouldn't even say he's the third option. No. No. And whenever he gets the ball, he doesn't even look at the rim. He just looks to pass it. And I know he's a pass first guy, but there's yeah. some points where he's in the paint and he's not even looking to shoot. I, I just think that boggles my mind. Yeah, no, it's pretty mind-boggling. And it ends up just hurting the rest of the team. But I guess this is the perfect place for him because, you know, he's not really taking anything away from Kyrie and KD when he comes back. But instead, he's really just adding – to getting the ball to them, you know, or to them. Eh, didn't say that right. He's just really adding on to getting the ball to them and making sure they get more points. Because really, I think his best thing besides his defense is obviously his passing. Right. I agree. Yeah. So he's just you're playing those strengths essentially. So they're, they're asking him, hey, you're not going to score here. You're going to just play defense and work the offense as a passer. Definitely. I definitely think they're going to be in the mix though come April and May. I mean, they're right there at the top. They're only. I think two and a half back of the two seed, which is the Sixers right now. So I think those four teams are definitely the top four. And then, like you said, Miami is a team you can't ignore. Cleveland's a pretty solid team. You have some teams down there in the playing range, like the Knicks and the Hawks. I mean, one of those teams gets in as a seven or eight. I mean, they're no slouch in the first round. So yeah. we'll have more time to talk about the NBA down the road because I think if you go to the Western Conference, there's a lot more surprises over there, considering there's a lot of good teams that are kind of in the middle or at the bottom. And then you have some surprises. I mean, there's a not many surprises at the top. There's one surprising. The Kings have been a surprise, but uh, Denver, yeah. Denver and Memphis, you kind of expect to be somewhere up there, but the Kings have been out of nowhere. Yeah. They're 27 and 21. Yeah. They, yeah. They have home court in the first round. So, but well, hold on. Yeah. Go ahead. A lot of, not that much. A lot of teams are in a very close range. I mean, the Kings are in third. They have 27 wins. You go down all the way to, you know, where the Lakers are in the standings, they have 23 wins. Right. It's not that much difference in the game, in the games. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's, and it's like, it's very bunched up in the Western. I'll country. take two teams playing each other tonight. The Warriors and the Thunder. The Warriors are 25 and 24. And I think the Thunder are 24 and 25. I don't know. There's just a lot more, a lot more parity in the West this year. A lot of good teams in the West. I yeah, like it's been like that for a while. Right. I think it's not as top heavy as it was last year, the year before, but there's a lot of good, decent teams. I feel like the East has better great teams, but the West has better good teams. I don't know if that makes any sense. You, but, know, you know what's yeah. weird, too? Because in the Western Conference, you kind of got a lot of those teams who are trying to win. It's the same in the Eastern Conference until you get past, like, the Hawks. Right. Like, the AC. Mm-hmm. Like what is what is a team like Washington doing? Like they're trying to win. They have literally barely any cap space left, and they just traded Hakamura for I don't know just because I, I just they didn't just because they have so many forwards. That was literally their reasoning. I think. Right, and that's like because they Kuzma on the trade block too. But yeah, I, mean, I don't know what's gonna happen there. They just signed Bradley Beal to this massive deal. I know, and he's taking up a lot of money. But that indicates that you're with that you're trying to win if you're trying to keep your stars. But then they also, I mean, I just don't understand what they're doing there. Yeah, like they're I, I, trying I, to stay nice to Bradley Beal and like just keep him around as like a franchise guy. But like in reality, they're not going to be able to ever improve their team unless they start tanking. Right. And then I'll take another team. Sorry, I just hit the microphone by accident. Chicago. Yeah, same thing. Chicago has DeMar DeRozan and Zach Levine. I'm not sure about DeRozan's contract, but Zach Levine signed a massive extension a few years ago. He's getting 200 something million for five years. Yeah, and I know they're Lonzo. trying to win. They have Lonzo Ball and Nikola Vucevic. They got a really solid core there. It's just they're not as good as the other Eastern teams. I mean, what's their ceiling? They get to the first round and lose. Yeah, exactly. I don't a know. A lot of teams like that. Yeah, I'll throw one more question to you. You can answer this pretty quickly. I'm not sure if you paid attention too much to the West because you're just talking about the West. But would you take the Nuggets and the Grizzlies, one of those two, to win the West? Or would you take the field? Because the field is very interesting. There's a lot of teams like the Clippers and the Warriors and the Suns who are down there. Absolutely. Give me the Warriors over anybody. If the Warriors can get their team together, I would certainly hope that with the star power they have, that they can make a run in the playoffs. Right. a lot of other good teams there, too. Right. And the reason I only 
mention Denver and Memphis because I think they've clearly separated themselves as the top two in the West. And I'm not saying that they're better than the Warriors at full strength, but they've clearly been better than the Warriors this season just because the Warriors had a bad start to the year, couldn't win on the road. But Denver and Memphis, I mean, you look at Memphis, they got John Morant, they have a lot of young talent, but Denver, you look at, they got Jokic, Murray, they're very deep. I don't know. We'll see though. Thursday night, the Warriors do play in Denver. So that might be a little bit of a litmus test, but we'll talk about more of the NBA as the season goes along. Cause there's more storylines that will come up, but anything else you want to add before we go here, Jimmy? No. Yeah. So I guess we'll see you Friday. We'll probably touch on more of the Super Bowl. But we'll also talk about maybe college basketball, NBA, NHL, whatever, whatever's trending. So we'll be back on Friday. Thank you again for listening and we will see you then.